What's up, y'all? This is DJ Muggs, repping at Cypress Hill Soul Assassins, coming live from Los Angeles, and you're watching Crate Diggers. I think my record collection at this point is probably between 10, 15,000 records. I had an uncle, and he um, was into classic rock. He was a hippie, he lived in my room, and he had um, eight track tapes, velvet posters, black lights, beads. So seeing all that stuff and just hearing Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, and you know, Hendrix, all that growing up was my early, early influences. My mom's was into Motown, the Beatles, and all the stuff on the radio. You know, growing up listening to that, my little Walkman and stuff, and around 78, 79, I really start hearing the new rap language, and um, I just got stuck at that point. It was like hip hop and break dancing, and writing on the walls, and seeing Jam Master J, and then I was like, oh, I wanna do that. I think that's the time when I started collecting records, because I needed records to go play in the parties. I had advantage over a lot of LA people because I was back and forth from New York at that time before you would have knowledge even just from style to music to stuff. So I would, I would bring back Rakim when it was on Zankia Records, you know, and like go to the Wiz and bring, bring Bismarck Records back and bring all these records back and stuff and um, bring all the Molly Mall Red Alert tapes back. And it was like, yo, what's this? I would be in record stores on the road. It would be the first thing. I'd grab the Yellow Pages, hit record stores and dig. Um, I'd come back from Europe with boxes and boxes of records. It cost me two, three grand to ship records back, back in the days. You know, I'd go hit all the mom and pop spots and I'd go hit the swap meets, a lot of swap meets. And I'd try to go to um, <clears throat> old antique shops, places that were off the beaten path, you know, cause you go to some of these record stores and they want $40, $50 for a record. Man, you know, I'm making five bucks an hour at that, that age. You know what I mean? I ain't spending all that money on records. So I'd go get the 99 cent records and just use, use weird, obscure things. And the funny thing was when I had did the first Cypress record, I think I had two crates of records. And I did the whole album with two crates of records. You know, now I got 15,000 records and I can't get shit done. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just kidding, but it's at the time when you're forced, if when they give you this one drum machine with, with 10 seconds of sampling time and you have two crates of records, you, you get real creative, you know what I mean? So it ain't the equipment, it's what you have in here and how you could make it come through and come out. Meters. You know the meters from New Orleans, Alan Toussaint and all them? They was, um, their drums were ridiculous, man. When I first heard the meters, I was like, this what the fuck is this? So if I can get any record I wanted to get, it'd probably be the 12 inch of Bebop, Ram LZ and K-Rob with um, um, Basquiat. You know, he did the artwork. He produced the record as well. It's probably one of my all time favorite songs, period. And I got the version on um, Profile, you know, the Profile volume compilation yeah. records. But if I could afford five grand to go get that record and have it, I'd probably get it and frame it and put it in the house. Bo Diddley, this was a good time in rock and roll, man. You know, especially when you have Chuck Berry starting, which we know is like the modern day rock and roll. Everybody taking their shit. All that Mississippi shit was big back in the days. I would probably say any of my Led Zeppelin records. You know, they're still the classics. They're still my inspiration, man, from, you know, I'd look at them covers back then and you'd hear all these like folklores about the covers. There was no internet. There was no way to find out about those bands. You heard they was living in Aleister Crawley's castle and all these stories and was like, the wizard and the record backwards and the four symbols. It's all a crock of shit. But for you, you know what I mean? You was into that shit. And I'd look at them and I'd put the records on and he'd just hear these stories and um, creativity runs wild. You know, it was like Harry Potter to me, listening to Led Zeppelin. And that inspired me when I made my records. You wouldn't see us on the covers because I used to look at records when I would see somebody, the way they was dressed, it would date the record. And then when I would know about you, I was like, okay, I don't need, I know everything. I don't need to know anything no more. And um, it was nothing left to my creativity. So looking at those records, it inspired me to never put us on the covers of our records and just keep things for people's imagination because the records would never end, they'd be timeless. Producing got me into music, man. Like I was into rock and I was into hip hop and I didn't want to hear shit. I was like, shut the fuck up with all that, except for reggae. But when I got into producing and I started buying blues records and soul records and jazz records was because of sampling, which got me into all kinds of music, which just made me pretty much love all kinds of music and realize that there's just good and bad in everything. There's nothing else, man. It either sucks or it's fucking good. And you got to go find the good stuff, man, because it ain't going to come knocking on your fucking door, you know? 
the Montclairs. It's a good record right there. I know I sampled this for something, and I'm not telling you what. <laughs> Let's take a walk back here, fellas. I got some more stuff in this room right here. This room right here is mostly hip hop, classic hip hop stuff like, like LL, radio album. When this record came out right here, boy, that changed my life, man. LL Cool J. It was a funny time when people was like rocking hip hop, Limp Bizkit. I was like, what the f are you talking about, man? What, be, before it was funk, before jazz, it was rock. It was Rick Rubin bringing Run DMC, giving them rock and roll, bringing the Beastie Boys. That was rock. Public Enemy was uh, rock and roll energy, you know what I mean? Sampling, who was they sampling? F***ing Slayer, you know what I'm saying? So rock was in hip hop since day one, man. So, you know, I don't know where they thought like, well, all oh, this is the new shit, because it wasn't the new shit. Like I would play this all the time. Why is it fresh? So, you know, like, a lot of times people would use those scratches out here. So why is it got to be so damn tough? Like, and so why is it fresh? That was from this record. I used to play this record all the time. So why is it fresh? And when I want to do some old school electronic hip hop shit, I'll pull that out. The old shit. Dollar Bill, y'all. Divine Sounds. In 1984. And this is my all time classic right here. And you know this is the original, right? Don't fuck around. The impact on this right here had on me, man. Just from sound. Like, what the f is that fucking noise in these records? It made no sense to me, man. It was like organized noise. And looking at that cover right there, you didn't know who was what or what was who. And I love that about this record. I got this at um, the Compton Swami. Compton Swami would have the records first before record stores. And, you know, the, I, I didn't stop playing this record for like four years. And I still throw this on. I'll put it on and roll with it for like a week sometimes. Um, some B-Girl records. This is just some random independent hip hop shit from back in um, B-Boy records. When I was living in LA, I used to call, I wasn't on the radio at the time or nothing, but I called B-Boy records because um, they had all the KRS-One stuff, Scott Rock, and I was like, yo, I'm on the radio in LA. Can y'all start sending me records? So they would send me boxes of these fucking records and um, thinking I was on the radio. But you know, I just wanted to get on the fucking, I just wanted to get those records, man, and like be a little bit ahead of the curve because Knowledge is power, right? Then we'll get here. This is, now I'm gonna get into some electro-funk type shit that was big in LA. This dish right here is by a group called Sexual Harassment. It's called I Need a Freak. And it's the same kind of beat as, um, kind of like White Horse. This shit right here will rock a fucking party right here. This record right here was a big influence on the whole, on, on West Coast, you know, um, hip hop, period, Tour de France. Um, Artists like Egyptian Lover, you know, this shit right had everybody breathing heavy on their records, trying to make beats like, you know, um, Metal on Metal, um, Tour de France, you know, Planet Rock comes from a German band, you know. So you could say there's these German guys pretty much influenced hip hop because from Planet Rock starts the whole Miami Bay scene, starts the whole West Coast, shit like um, Egyptian Lover and all that, it all comes from Planet Rock, man, which comes from Kraftwerk. The other, the, the other part of me, was I was in Brooklyn all the time because I was big into dance hall back in the days and just getting all my dance hall records right here, man. Just constantly buying all the good dance hall records. Local Red, Rude Boy, Tony Rebel, Papa San. You know, these records are straight from Jamaica. This shit's like 80, I don't know, sometime in the 80s. Cosmic Slop, Funkadelic. Here's with a nappy dugout. Sample came from for Ice Cube. You know, this again was psychedelic rock records, man. Call it funk. Yeah, they would go call Sly Funk and Barcades, but that shit was rock, man. And this record is ridiculous. Broken Heart, Can't Stand, Strain, all kind of good records on here. Very influential right here to, to today. If you go on and listen to these old funkadelic records, the sounds and the music in that, man, that'll inspire you to do some shit. What would give you an edge when I was coming up as a producer was how hard you dug and what records you found, you know? It wasn't about just your technical skill on the equipment. I said, I'll take two days a week just to go dig because that would make me better by the records I had to, you know, use in part of my arsenal.